are the God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination nor organization whatsoever. We read the Word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men, which Jesus himself rebuked. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7, 9. This is our journey through the word, and we are restoring the name of Yahuwah God in our worship. Again, we begin with a shorter video, which will demonstrate the pronunciation of the Son's name, the Messiah. Then, we will continue a supporting video with more biblical evidence and proofs, and we will lay it down. And in that second video, we will deal with the other names you have heard, which we do not use, and we'll explain why. Again, when you see the origin, you may well choose to do as we have. But this is your decision. We're not telling you what to say, what to think. We are offering you a case. Now, you take this information and go out and prove it. We're not here to condemn anyone for using the transliter transliterated word from another transliterated word uh, that somehow comes out in the wash to Jesus. We know you as we did for many years of our in our own lives, intent to worship the Messiah and Son of Yahuwah God with his name, and we do not condemn that. So relax. No one is doubting your heart here. And if one does in comments, we will stand against such condemnation as well. But after you know how to say his name, we hope you will decide, as we have, to restore his name in your worship again, as we have. Some criticize us as well for still using the name Jesus as we just did a few times in our videos, but they don't realize we are trying to educate people, and when one has never heard the true name of Yahuwah God and the name of the Messiah, which we're about to discuss, they seem to f very foreign at first when one first hears them. We use the real names over and over again. But we make it clear, we mean the Father, God, and the Son, Jesus, which is how many of our viewers know him. So it's familiar to them and they understand. But we're making that connection in our videos to assist in transitioning those who are ready to transition. And hopefully, by the end of this video, that will be many. As we said before... This is one of the most critical issues of our day, which is exactly why such effort has been expended to obscure these two names in applying modern Hebrew to ancient Hebrew names that were obviously from an origin of ancient Hebrew, not modern Hebrew, erasing them and replacing them with generic names or titles. Yes, this certainly must be important when you see all the confusing smoke screens surrounding these topics. So, let's cut through the leaven meant to expand and obscure and get right to the heart of the matter. First, the name transliterated as Jesus from Hebrew to Greek, and yes, we will prove scholars actually do try or attempt to start with the Hebrew. And we'll show you this in the next video, not to pick on a scholar, he's doing his job, but we'll prove to you that it, it really doesn't work, it's clunky, it's very, very clunky. And then they go from the Greek to the Latin, and then into English and try to justify getting over somehow stretching to say it says Jesus. The Greek rendering is pretty consistent. 
IESIS or however you want to say it. It's okay, again, if we get it wrong. Um, We're not worried about that name, and here's why. It has nothing to do with the origin. We go to the origin. We don't want to know uh, at any point you start in this whole transitional transliteration process. We could care less about because it's not even logical. Now, when we get to the history video, video that we have coming up, we will show you Greek did not have a J letter nor J sound until around 1500 A.D., So there is no getting J out of the Greek, and nor did Latin until the same point. So no, ancient Greek, ancient Latin had no J. So it cannot be Jesus other than a modern rendering of a transliteration of a transliteration, and it's just nonsense. Both languages were accommodating the so-called Germanic languages. That's what they'll tell you in all of the records, however... That's deceiving because it was really accommodating Yiddish, which is not a Germanic language at all. In origin, it's Turkic, and it's from the Russian steppes, not Germany in origin. We'll get there. But we find this process to be one of the most ridiculous, honestly, of all we have seen. We know the name is Hebrew. Yes, the New Testament was written in Greek. But if you are going to migrate his name from one language into another and then into yet another, (laughs) applying the wrong era of those languages in between throughout the process, you're going to end up with, well, one big confusing mess. You know, we love Pastor Stephen Anderson, especially some of his videos, for instance, But he actually created a video, again, based on his seminary training, justifying this nonsense in process. It's amazing how sold to this process we are, yet it came through the Catholic Church. What? Okay, anyway, we reject it as being completely illogical and irrational, flawed and wrong, and we will prove it in this video and the next one. Why would we be so strong in this? Because the precedent is right there in Scripture. Once again, yet some are so busy justifying the acts of the Catholic Church and the Pharisees, which is really what they're doing, They can't even seem to think logically. You will never find a J in ancient Hebrew. End of discussion. That is not up for debate. Period. It is not an ancient Hebrew. It is not an ancient Greek. It is not an ancient Aramaic, even, if you want to try to take it through there. Nor is it in ancient Latin. It did not show up as a sound in these languages until it was accommodating the infusion of Yiddish in about the 1500s. So any justification of its use, even to read this Greek word, is simply nonsense. And there's no other way to put it. We love you, Pastor Anderson. Here's a logical track one can follow to get to the actual pronunciation of his name. See what you think Review this, and then go out and test it for yourself. In the Greek New Testament, at least twice, the same exact Greek letters used to render Jesus, eventually, are used to refer specifically to the name Joshua from the Old Testament, which is originally in Hebrew, right? It's a Hebrew name, not a Greek name. But it's rendered in Greek in Acts 7.15 and Hebrews 4.8, which also are fathers that came after brought in with Jesus. Now, it says Jesus, and there's the word that we're all probably familiar with in Greek that's Jesus, right? Well, now, this story is about Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. What happened? 
until the days of David. They were ridding the land of Israel of the Nephilim, right? Okay, the giant tribes, especially that had giants, at least among them. They weren't necessarily all giants. But the point is, this renders Jesus, but this isn't Jesus, right? This is Joshua, okay? But it is the same exact word. See that? Which of the founding fathers of Israel is this referring to? Obviously, Joshua. Again, moving on. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, no, 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 Joshua, but it's okay because it's the same exact word had given them rest, who? The Israelites. Then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So, again, an indisputable reference to Joshua, not Jesus. But the name is the exact same letters. Once again, no scholar we have ever read has ever disputed this point. So, We know the origin of the Greek name, which leads to Jesus eventually after two transliterations into modern versions of those languages, of course, not the ancient ones, is indisputably the very same as Joshua. And what is Joshua? Well, we will explain that is a wrong pronunciation as well. Okay, we'll straighten it out. And also, it may very well also be meant to obscure, but it is Hebrew origin, not Greek, right? No one can debate that. The names of Joshua and Jesus have the same origin, period. But let's stick with the Greek for just a moment. In the Greek Septuagint, where the Hebrew Old Testament was first translated into Greek, we see the exact same things. In fact, the definition of the name in the Septuagint is either Joshua or Jesus. Why? Because even though both are pronounced differently and wrong, I might add, because they're actually the exact same name, they are both the exact same name Literally, letter for letter. Don't worry, we are not making a case that the Septuagint nor the next book are scripture today, so you can relax. We only use that really as an historical context, sometimes just to compare it. What does it look like in the Greek? Does that make sense? And it sometimes brings to light some things. There's also some things in the Septuagint that are not in your King James Bible, and it's worth looking into. Why? Where did it come from? Is it possible that the King James is missing something? And the answer is, sure, it's possible. All things are possible. We are to prove all things, not just the things that we feel more comfortable with, um, you know, just leaving alone. So, these are merely historical evidence. This timestamps this historical evidence at around 150 B.C. or so. Again, not debating that date either today, but roughly is good enough for the purposes of this video. Then, we have the historical book of Sirach, which is considered Apocrypha, which is fine for this purpose. We're just looking for the Hebrew and Greek rendering of the name Joshua or Jesus. That's all. Again, just looking at the word, we have Sirach, in Greek, and it's the exact same letters, same word, for what is translated as Jesus. And we also have the book in Hebrew, so we can see, just in this one book, because we there are copies in Greek, there's copies in Hebrew, we can see how it was treated in the Greek, and see how it was treated in the Hebrew. So, that begins to establish the precedent and only begins, we're just warming up here, that the name called Jesus and Joshua are the exact same, not only in Greek, but also in Hebrew. Again, no one 
can dismantle this logic thus far. Enter the Book of Jubilees, another book which was actually considered inspired scripture and canon, so don't even ask us in comments, because it was by the keepers of the Qumran scrolls, the people before them, and the early church fathers all the way up until the Catholic Church removed it from the canon. It was there, and that is an indisputable fact. Now, as to why it was removed, we're not going to deal with that in this video, obviously, but it was the sixth most abundant book found in the Qumran scrolls. And it was even found in the same scroll jar with Genesis, for that matter. So, probably at least worth using as an historical text because it's dated around 200 BC. And again, that's not disputed. However, that was a copy. That was not the original. And that's where scholars really go wrong with a lot of things when they start assessing dates of a copy and then say, oh, well, that's when it was written, so it must have been written by someone after Moses, a disciple after. You know, there are some things like that, like the very end of the Torah where it says, and Moses died. Well, did Moses write and Moses died? You know what? He could have because he knew he was dying. Oh, how about that? Is that so hard to believe? Yet scholars will go on and on about such nonsense. But anyway, Jubilees tracks with Genesis, and actually we will be producing a full video testing it parallel with Genesis. If it is proven to be scripture, then it would actually be Torah, in fact. As it says, it was written by Moses. So a rather large ramification if it's the case. But again, we aren't making that case today. And we are only using this one scripture from the book of Jubilees. Just one. That's it. Okay, chapter 12. And I will be a God to thee and thy son and to thy son's son and to all thy seed. Fear not from henceforth and unto all generations of the earth. I am thy God. Certainly sounds like Genesis, doesn't it? Yeah. And the Lord God said, Open his mouth and his ears, that he may hear and speak with his mouth, with a language which has been revealed. For it had ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the day of the overthrow of Babel. Hmm, this is interesting. Now, see, this is the kind of stuff that, yes, you got to test it, you got to prove it, you got to vet it. Yes, 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 but to ignore it is nonsense. We should be reading this book. And I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips, and I began to speak with him in Hebrew in the tongue of the creation. Wow. And he took the books of his fathers. What? Abraham had books written by his forefathers? Yes. Noah took some on the ark with him, if you go back and read some of the accounts. Oh, but that's not in Genesis. Well, have you ever considered that maybe it's not in Genesis because Genesis and Jubilees were written alongside each other? So even though they confirm each other on many points, they're not the exact same verbiage or it wouldn't be worth writing. Now, so he took the book of his fathers and these were written in Hebrew and he transcribed them and he began from henceforth to study them and I made known to him that which he could not understand, and he studied them during the six rainy months. So, this establishes that the language of creation was Hebrew. Now, not modern Hebrew. No, 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 that wasn't even the language of the Bible. We need to get that through our heads. Modern Hebrew, throw it out, <laughs> and go back to the ancient if you really want to know how to pronounce things in the Bible. Now, it could have been in another form. And some say, well, no, Aramaic is the original language. Okay, that's fine. But how do you know it wasn't called Hebrew originally? Or some say, oh, it was Phoenician. Ancient Phoenician is the... Whatever. How do you know that wasn't called Hebrew? See, it really doesn't matter. 
The language which Abraham learned at that point was ancient Hebrew, period. And that was the language of creation. And actually, we do have a precedence for that. Notice, there were writings at that time before Moses was born, and we'll deal with that in another video. So, not in this series, but a different series. So, if Hebrew was the language of creation, who exactly spoke that language then? Well, as far as man, obviously, Adam, all the way to Noah, and even after creation, all the way up until the Tower of Babel incident, right? I mean, that is what is, this is saying. That's when languages were confused and the earth was divided in the days of Abraham's ancestor, Peleg, who we've covered in great detail in our Solomon's Gold series. So go watch that if you haven't, because it will blow your mind. So, at least to Peleg, they spoke Hebrew all the way up until then. And it was renewed in Abraham's time, which is only a few generations. It's not a huge, huge gap. Remember that. So, the language of creation. Wow. John 5.43 I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye shall receive. You will receive. John 10.30, I and my Father are one. So, if he came in his Father's name, the Father's name, what language is the Father's name in? Hebrew. And he even makes it clear, a false Messiah, which the world will receive, will come in his own name, a name in his own tongue, not linked to Yahuwah, which Messiah's name is, and we will prove it. If he and the Father are one, then they both have names in what language? Hebrew. And again, nothing here that is in any way a leap in logic, is there? In fact, we believe you will find clarity in this logic. In fact, Isaiah says the same thing the other way around. The Father's name is in the Messiah's name. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Go ahead, sing along. <laughs> and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Do you hear these names? Okay, these aren't the names of just a regular prophet. Do you hear these names? Some of you can even sing along, but yet, did you notice what it really says here? His name shall be called. His name shall be called. Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. That's Yahuwah's title. El Shaddai. The Everlasting Father. Is he the father? No, he's the son. But he's going to be called the everlasting father. How's that possible? Is that a discrepancy? No. This doesn't say he'll just come as a representative of the name of Yahuwah. It says he will have his name within his it's okay if you don't agree with each of our interpretations of each of these scriptures along the way, or if you disagree with a point here or there, maybe you don't like the book of Jubilees, that's, that's okay, but hear us out, because we are going to prove to you that this is Hebrew, and it is not Greek. Now, we draw this conclusion, but you will find it to be well-founded in Scripture. We know, though, that the first prophecy of Messiah appears in the Garden of Eden, whose language was Hebrew, according to Jubilees. Again, it's okay if that's foreign to you. We'll support this in other ways as well. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. 
it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, the concept of Messiah is not one from the days of Isaiah, or even Moses, or even back to Abraham. No, 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 no. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And of course, it was known by Yahuwah God from the very beginning. It is among the most ancient of concepts. And John 1 reveals, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. By the way, it's Yahuwah. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. Where did John get this from? Likely the book of Enoch, actually. So, Messiah was in the beginning, participating in creation. If the language of creation was Hebrew. Then he spoke what during creation to create? Hebrew. And his name would be likely, and will prove definitely, Hebrew. But we'll prove that further. Of course, we know John is writing about Messiah. But let's read further and confirm so that is clear. He was not that light. Now, that means John the Baptist. That's where we just were. But was sent to bear witness of that light. Remember the voice crying in the wilderness that precedes the Messiah. That was the true light, meaning Messiah, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And they wonder why the sons of light is a term in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that must be Essene. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Do you not bother to read the Bible? But anyway, okay. <laughs> he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So nobody knew who he was until he was birthed through a woman. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which were not born, not of blood. Note, bloodlines don't get anyone into the kingdom of heaven. Pharisees may believe that. Some may even try to justify that in Christianity. It's wrong. No bloodlines have nothing to do whatsoever. You must know him. Anyway, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, who is the word that was since the beginning, participating in creation, the Son of Yahuwah God transliterated from a transliteration as uh, from two languages that are modern uh, rather than their ancient language into what we call Jesus. Okay. And Jubilee said the word was written in Hebrew as well, right? Right. And the language of creation was Hebrew. And this is confirmed in Revelation where Messiah says he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is all saying the same thing. So yes, he was there at creation. And whose language is Hebrew, not Greek? So what's his name? It's Hebrew, but we're not done yet. Enter the book of Enoch 1. Again, not canonizing it, relax. See, this confirms scripture, so we're safe here. 
And at that hour, that son of man, where have we heard that term? Well, you hear the Messiah referring to himself as son of man many times, yet it's only in the scripture one time in Daniel, one time. The book of Enoch has it many, many times. So where did it come from? Probably Enoch. But anyway, son of man was named in the presence of the Lord of spirits and his name before the head of days. Yea, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of the heaven were made, his name was named before the Lord of spirits. This is Enoch's trip to heaven, which is well documented in Genesis. While in heaven, he sees the Messiah, and he was named then. He existed then, just as John says, just as we've seen in all of these overwhelming, abundant references. Messiah was named when? Before the sun, moon, and stars were created before, or at least in the beginning stages of creation. Well, wait, what was the language of creation? Hebrew. This would be a Hebrew name, not Greek. And the Messianic prophecy of Micah further confirms this. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. His goings forth, his presence, he was, he existed of old, from everlasting. What does everlasting mean? Forever. Back in the past. Especially. So, since the beginning. And did Mary name him a Greek name? Did she even pick his name? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Iesus, <laughs> in Greek, transliterated from a transliteration through two languages that are modern and not their ancient format as Jesus. What is this name really? It's actually, in origin, Hebrew. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So, we have established that the Messiah was named at least by the time of creation, right? And the language of creation is Hebrew, not Greek. He has the exact same name in Greek as Joshua, and also in Hebrew, the same. So, do we know his actual, original name? No, the source. Not in Greek, the source. He was named by an angel from heaven. What name would he have given him? The same one that he had from the days of creation. This is not a new naming. He already had a name, according to Enoch especially. So why transliterate it into Greek, then Latin, then English, for instance, and claim you have some form of logic involved in that? It's confusion, deception, and ultimately nonsense. Now, Let's clear this up. Let's start with the origin of his name rather than a transliteration. See, we're not even entering that whole process. We're just throwing it all out because there's no need to just go to the source. Some say, well, why didn't the disciples do that? I mean, why, why didn't they use his Hebrew name then if that's the case? I mean, you know, they wrote in Greek. Well, 
Are you sure they didn't? Because we are going to show you New Testament fragments, not in this video, but in the history video in this series, that have the Hebrew name of Yahuwah, the yad Hey wah Hey, in them. Right along, right in the midst of the Greek. So you have the Greek words, and then boom, the four-letter name of Yahuwah, right there. Now, we don't have original manuscripts of the New Testament. Are you sure they did not write that name of the Messiah in Hebrew as well? No one can say that, because we don't have the original manuscripts. But we can say the origin of this name, which is the most important thing, is Hebrew. And that cannot be disputed. Again, what we call Joshua and Jesus are the exact same name. Why? Why put them differently? Uh, who knows why? I mean, you can only guess that it was to obscure the name of the Messiah. And yeah, in this video, once again, we will catch the Pharisees doing something here. And this one's going to shock you probably. Um, according to AberinePublications.com, a well-respected Jewish source, in fact, Joshua has two spellings. Many sources, even Blue Letter Bible, render this a pronunciation of Yahu Yahoshua. But, when you look at the name, that's simply unfounded. There's no precedent for Jeho at all. Jeho. No. No, 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 no. You're talking about the name of the Messiah here. And we already know that he came in the Father's name. Was that literal? Now it's when we prove to you it absolutely 100% was. Because even the Jewish source, Abarim Publications, says the name Joshua is a compilation of two elements, the first one being the appellative Yahoo. Yad, hey, wa. There it is, right in the beginning of the word. We know how to pronounce that word because that's in the names of many of the prophets. That is in the name of Yahuwah. Yahuwah's name is in this name. Because why? Because the transliteration of a transliteration, Jesus came in the Father's name, which is not G, G, nor sus, or however you want to say that. It doesn't fit at all, which in turn are abbreviated forms of the tetragrammaton. Someone asked us about that. Tetra means for, grammaton, probably grammar related, but we will cover that later. The name of the Lord... Why H W H? You mean Yahuwah? Let's just say what it is. Why? Why do they keep doing these letters? Well, because they're trying to obscure the name. That's why. The second element of the name Joshua slash Jesus. So, again, it, it, this isn't us writing this. Okay, this is Aberine Publication saying Joshua is Jesus. It's the same name. See, see, see. Comes from the root verb Yasha meaning to save or deliver. So the name means Yah is salvation. And the name Jesus means, well, it's a transliteration of a transliteration through two languages where letters don't even exist that are used in the name. So it literally has no meaning as a word. Now, did we say the Son of God does not have meaning? No. So don't go there. Please don't go there. Because we get that kind of stuff very regularly. Um, that's the first version of this name. But let's go ahead and review the second version, and then we're going to sound this out so we all know how to pronounce it. And you can then test that and see if you agree. Now, on the second way to pronounce this name, the ending could be Shua. But the rest of the word is really faulty logic. Whose name is this? It's Messiah's. The meaning, Yah is salvation, also fits Joshua's leading the Israelites into the promised land. Was he the Messiah? No. 
just a foreshadowing of things to come. But no, he was not the Messiah. But they have the exact same name. And it both means Yah is salvation. Some try to argue that Joshua means Yah is salvation. Well, that's because you are pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> I mean, the letters are right there. It's obviously got Yahu in it. So certainly it's Yah. And then Yasha is certainly the rest of the word. These are indisputable facts. These are not up for debate. Now, for the name of Messiah. We're going to use the first version, and we'll show you the second as well. However, when given the option of the two ways to pronounce the name, and both are accurate, we tend to choose the simplest of the two. Simple. But we'll cover both. The first three letters are the exact same first three letters in the name of Yahuwah, aren't they? yad he wa we know this is well-defined, especially in the names of the prophets who also bore his name within their names, just as Messiah came in his name. And yes, he meant it literally. If that precedent was not there, then perhaps there could be a debate of Yeho and all of these other things. Probably never one that involves a transliteration, of a transliteration into two languages that are modern, not their ancient uh, equivalents. Uh, yeah, no, there's, there's no debate to be had with the name Jesus. It is just not his name. But on these three letters, Yahoo, there is no debate whatsoever. They are Yahoo, not Yehu, not Yeho, or anything else. There are not two ways to pronounce this only one, as Yahuwah only has one name and one pronunciation. So we begin with Yahu, the name of the Father. Looks like Messiah meant it, didn't he? The next letter is Shin, which has an SH sound, even in modern Hebrew for that matter. And the last letter is IN, which at the end of a word pronounces as an A or A ah sound. So sound it out, and it's Yahu Sha. As we said, though there is a second way to pronounce it, so let's review that quickly. Again, exact same letters, except there is a wa or u added, so it's Yahushua. This is an acceptable pronunciation, but why add another letter and syllable when you don't have to? Let's keep it simple as Yahusha. But if you hear one pronouncing it Yahushua, they are not wrong, just long. Oh, nice rhyme. More doctrine dropping like rain, I guess. Teasing. So there you have it, a simple, logical explanation of the name of the Messiah, Yahusha. Now, we prove it out as we always do. We broke this into two videos, not only for length, but to give you a shorter video of the two pronunciations. We did the same with Yahuwah earlier, so you can reference them again and again if you need. The next video will show you why Yeshua, Yahshua, Yahashua, Joshua, neither are his name. We will show you the original, and especially Yeshua, really may surprise you. First of all, it is not a shortened name. Yes, it has one letter less, but if you look at the syllables, Yahshua and Yahusha, 
It's the same. So it doesn't shorten the name. No, it's not a shortened name. And wow, when you see the origin of this name, wow is all I can say. Wait till you see this. Thank you for watching the Name of God series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell and view our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah God bless.